Today on the podcast, we are going to finish our story of Disney artist Herb Ryman. If you've been with us for all 25 parts, I want you to feel absolutely fabulous about yourself. You have indeed accomplished something here, opening your mind to new perspectives about the history of animation and the history of the parks. I try to arrange these longer series so that not only do we get to understand the life of a key Disney figure, but also so the life of this person takes us through important moments in the development of the Disney company and at times the development of Hollywood. In this series, we've moved through the creation of massive Hollywood backlot sets that in ways were one inspiration for Disneyland. We spent many episodes focused on Walt's efforts in Central and South America to make those good neighbor films in the early 1940s. We examined how World War II affected the studio. We looked at the development and the expansion of Disneyland in California. And we also followed Ryman and other designers as they, after Walt's passing, created the Florida Resort. In our final installment of this story today, we will take a look at how, in Ryman's final years, he contributed to Epcot Center, Tokyo Disneyland and Euro Disneyland and how these projects again reshaped the Disney company. So if you're ready, here we go. During the late 1970s, Ryman's time was split between the two Disney parks then being designed. Tokyo Disneyland and Epcot. For Tokyo Disneyland, he translated the design style of Florida's Magic Kingdom for a Japanese audience, with particular attention to the varieties of trees and greenery that might not only be better appreciated by the Japanese, but would grow in Tokyo. Tokyo was typically 15 to 20 degrees cooler than Orlando. It was even significantly cooler than Anaheim which necessitated Disney to restructure its landscape plans as it created a castle park for this new location. The quality of sunlight in Tokyo was also significantly different than that of Orlando, which caused Ryman to rethink the color values he used in his paintings. In Ryman's early paintings, mostly done in acrylics, he presented wide views of the proposed park, from the castle to an open green space, from the entrance plaza over to World Bazaar. In multiple paintings, he brushed out the interior space of World Bazaar, an indoor shopping area filled with various stores and eateries that served as that park's main street. In many paintings, the sightline was arranged so that viewers could see Cinderella's castle rising up like a dream in the distance. Once more, he brushed out designs for Tomorrowland. He also designed concepts for Meet the World, an attraction that explored the history of Japan. This was another ideal assignment for Herbie, who as a young man had spent time in Japan. The show would combine animatronic figures with film, to present the story of how Japan, once an isolated nation, slowly connected with the world around it. Ryman's paintings depicted how the Japanese and Chinese influenced each other's culture, largely through the arts, technology, trade, and education. This, too, had been a topic that interested Ryman in his youth. The show, however, like many arranged for theme parks, focused on positive aspects of Japan's long-standing relationship with neighboring countries, while at the same time minimizing its equally strong history of war. But the Japanese weren't the only ones concerned about how they should present themselves to the world. WED, too, was concerned how they would be received by the world now that they were designing their first international park. This burden was one of many that WED designers carried with them through the design process. The sense that they needed to adapt a deeply American experience for a world audience. Ryman himself thought it was a tremendous responsibility because if it's not done right and controlled properly, it could disgrace the Disney name. 
Ryman worked on Tokyo Disneyland at the same time he worked on Epcot Center, two parks that would open within a half year of each other. He created concept paintings for the front half of Epcot Center, an area called the Future World focused on cutting-edge technology. He painted parkscapes that featured the volcano-shaped building of the Land Pavilion and the high-peaked steel and glass science and invention pavilion that was never built. In a canvas focused on Spaceship Earth, a beautiful painting in which Spaceship Earth after a storm is backlit by the sun, Ryman inserted an outline of Walt Disney's face into the sky, carefully outlined by the edge of clouds, as a way of keeping Walt's presence alive in this project, but management asked him to remove it. For World Showcase, Ryman designed dozens of international pavilions situated around the 40-acre lagoon. I myself and my friends visualized this enormous acreage as being a showcase for all the dreams of mankind, Ryman said. His job was to design international areas in such a way as to interest prospective sponsors. Each World Showcase pavilion would be roughly 300 feet long on the side that opened to the water, though some pavilions, particularly those with rides or attractions, would be much deeper than other pavilions. In general, Ryman was given about three or four acres of real space for each of his designs. He created paintings for pavilions that presented the culture and architecture of Morocco, Israel, and Equatorial Africa. Of course, he created paintings that presented the culture and architecture of China. Unlike most World Showcase pavilions, the one focused on Equatorial Africa wouldn't present a single country, rather multiple countries positioned around the equatorial region of the continent. By using equatorial in its title, Disney could easily move Morocco with its Mediterranean themes to its own pavilion area. It could also bypass South Africa, which was then embroiled in human rights issues related to apartheid. The concept for the Africa Pavilion included shows focused on African culture and music, along with film experiences highlighting the history of the region and its natural beauty. Disney artist Ken Anderson and nature cinematographer Jack Kofer developed presentation areas in the pavilion, but concept designs for the overall space were done by Ryman. Another of Ryman's key projects was the American Adventure at the back of World Showcase. Though some elements of Liberty Street, as first envisioned by Walt in the mid-1950s, found a home in Liberty Square, other elements of that project still existed only on paper. A few of these ideas would now be incorporated into the American Adventure, particularly aspects from the stage show about the Declaration of Independence. Twenty years earlier, Walt had imagined two stage presentations with limited movement figures for Liberty Street. One would present the presidents largely focused on Abraham Lincoln, the other on the history of the Declaration of Independence. The American experience now, with some designs refined by Ryman, would begin with an animatronic presentation of Thomas Jefferson writing the Declaration, a scene that was nearly identical to a scene Walt had originally proposed for an attraction called the Hall of the Declaration of Independence, which was never built. This would be one of the early scenes in the show, one that defined the origins of America. Beyond this sequence, Ryman focused on figure designs for the show's co-narrators. Initially, the show was to have three narrators, Ben Franklin from the 18th century, Mark Twain from the 19th century, and Will Rogers from the 20th century. But as the show developed, Will Rogers was dropped from the role of co-narrator and instead repositioned as a minor figure in one sequence. Ryman painted scenes for other stages, including one featuring naturalist John Muir seated thoughtfully beneath a tree. In ways, the American Adventure was Epcot's version of Tokyo Disneyland's Meet the World, a 30-minute show designed to explain a host country's culture and history, though where Meet the World turned its eyes away from controversial aspects of Japan's past, particularly its involvement with World War II, 
The American experience looked squarely at America's problems, from poverty to racism, from slavery to gender inequality. This show would prove to be one of the most culturally sophisticated presentation in any Disney park. For the pavilion itself, Ryman painted multiple canvases of the enormous colonial building, a multi-story show building arranged to look as though it had been built in the 1700s. He also painted a large format mural for the auditorium's foyer, a seven and a half foot wide canvas presenting immigrants gathered on Ellis Island with the Statue of Liberty in the background. Ryman found the work exciting and engaging. He said, uh, life is very pressured these days. But he could also see that the artistic culture of WED was changing, evolving. The WED had been started largely by live action set designers, studio architects, and engineers. WED was beginning to expand its design areas. It moved in small ways away from the world of film and into the world of theatrical design. Instead of hiring primarily those with film experience, Disney looked to those with experience in theatrical lighting, live sound, and theatrical set design, especially for World Showcase. With its courtyard pavilions and indoor areas, the tools of theater in many cases were more useful than the tools of backlot set design. Film set design primarily focused on static visual presentations, scenes that looked good on screen, while theater also focused on live presentations that could be appreciated from many angles, not just from the place where the camera was set. With this, Ryman understood that even though he was still conceptualizing sets, sets that were similar to those he had designed for MGM, the world of theme park design was beginning to move in a new direction, away from a primarily visual orientation and toward a type of themed immersion. The world where he had spent the last 25 years was again changing around him. By 1980, Ryman was a different person than he had been when he had worked with Walt on Disneyland. Around him were younger artists who were enamored with the paintings he had made for the parks, far more than the paintings he had produced for galleries. With this, he was starting to see the full value in identifying with the group in becoming one of the many talented, mostly invisible artists who, without public acknowledgement, created magnificent shows and themed lands. These artists, those that he now mentored, didn't primarily wish to create paintings for museums or galleries. They wanted to design space for guests to explore. In some circles, this was now considered serious art. At last, Ryman was beginning to embrace the value of collaborative studio work. Ryman now emphasized the importance of those lessons he had learned, perhaps a bit slowly, from Walt. Uh, no, I'm not going to sign my stuff, he told younger artists. I'm going to try to communicate exactly what Walt Disney wants, how beautiful and what it is this place is going to look like and what it's going to be. Occasionally, he even questioned the value of his gallery art, all of those paintings he had focused on for decades. I often wonder, he said, if such a simple piece of art as a watercolor or oil painting, which is purchased and hung in one man's home and seen only by his wife, children, or a few neighbors, I wonder if that is of more consequence than having a living conception. When walking through Disneyland, he reflected on how his paintings had been transformed into places that guests could explore. Uh, where else, Herbie said, could my art be appreciated by so many? Another time, he said, it is most gratifying to see millions of people enjoying some aspect that was frequently my sole idea. Something, however, that it took a Walt Disney to permit to come into being. Even though he understood that the parks created his largest audience, he was still drawn to his personal work, out of habit, out of love, out of the need to express himself. 
His personal art was still a way that he communed with his younger self, a young man who longed to have his work in galleries, a young man that Ryman understood now mostly belonged to a different era. The place where he felt most free to explore his personal vision remained the coastline in Carmel. He continued to paint the natural world, waves curving ashore, water cresting over rocks. When he was done painting for the day, he looked for smooth rocks to bring back, rocks that he would paint and give to his friends. He painted little palms or faces on them his sister Lucille said. For Marty Scalar, who now oversaw Wed, he created a Scalar Goil, an image of Marty's face arranged with the angular expression of a French gargoyle, painted on a rock. He gave them to people for Christmas, one of his friends explained. The gargoyle stone was a joke, one that made Marty laugh. In the latter part of his life, Ryman was beginning to understand his evolution as a 20th century artist from his early experiences at the Art Institute of Chicago in the 1930s to his time as an established Disney concept artist in the 1960s and now to his time as a senior consultant and mentor. I don't think of myself as just an artist or a painter, he told one of the younger artists at WED. I think of myself as a very curious observer and fortunately a lucid and graphic recorder. He found himself stepping away from the belief that important artists typically had deeply personal visions, and he started to believe that many works of art were created by a community. This was a worldview that defined the life experience of park artists who followed in his footsteps. His days at WED were mostly good, but he still could be upset by the bureaucracy of Disney as the studio evolved from one man's vision into a traditional company. During one moment of irritation, he told younger artists, a WED makes you take pills so you won't have any ideas of your own. Other times he was compelled to point out how much quicker this whole design process would move if Walt was still in charge. Uh, right now, if we were doing Epcot, the World Showcase, Walt would be two jumps ahead of that. He'd say, oh, well now, we've got to finish this, but don't forget we're going to do this and this and this. And then Walt would be describing yet another project that would carry his team forward, as opposed to the plodding, paperwork-focused habits of current management who had no idea what they would create after Epcot Center and Tokyo Disneyland. For the most part, he enjoyed his role as mentor as living connection to Walt. Even if Ryman hadn't said goodbye to Walt in person, he was often there now to offer Walt's perspective to younger employees. In return, younger employees adored him. Once a week, he invited young artists out to lunch where they talked about the old days and working with Walt. Often, according to Steve Cam, he'd try to trick them by saying, I'm going to take you fellas to lunch down the street to the weenie factory. But after they were all loaded up into his car, again, as Steve Cam recalled, uh, he'd take us to someplace nice like the Toluca Lake Tennis Club. Though Ryman still believed in the value of his personal art, he also helped young artists contextualize their personal goals in relationship to collective projects that would likely define their professional lives. Ryman would freely admit that in his opinion, the canvases he painted at home or in Carmel embraced higher artistic goals than those he made for Wed. Any one of the things I have done for myself is a better piece of true art than New Orleans Square, he said. He admitted that this approach to art often produced more interesting and complex canvases, but he also admitted that there was a second way to value art, based not on intrinsic merit, but in terms of its audience. However, very few people will see my gallery paintings, very few people will even understand them, and very few people will live or be enriched by them, but every day. People are delighted with a visit to the Pirates of the Caribbean and the atmosphere of Tom Sawyer's Island whenever I go there.
I sit and watch them, and I realize that if it wasn't me that got some of these things started, it would have been someone else. And if it was someone else, he suggested, he would have missed out on the satisfaction of knowing that his work had been enjoyed by tens of millions of people, even if they never knew his name. When asked how he developed his ideas for Disneyland, Ryman pointed out that the ideas came from Walt. Ryman's gift was that he was able to understand them with clarity and effectively translate them into drawings or paintings. I merely had the privilege of helping Walt, Ryman said. In the early 1980s, Ryman was a living icon at WED, a representative of the old days and the team once assembled by Walt. He rarely, if ever, turned people away from his office. He spent endless hours with artists, many of them half or even a third of his age. Because of his long socializing, he sometimes completed his assignments outside of regular work hours. Larry Kadeen, a night security guard at WED, recalled, uh, sometimes he would come in at night and work until 3 or 4 in the morning. During these hours, he knew he could get his work done without any interruptions or distractions. One night, Gadeen asked, How can you keep on working continually like this and so late? Ryman looked up from his easel. It's easy to do that, he said, because I love what I'm doing. When Epcot Center opened... Ryman was 72 years old, one of the oldest artists at WED. When people asked him about his retirement, he shrugged it off. Oh, when will I retire, he said. After I die, I will, but not before. All I ever wanted is to be an artist. I happen to like it. By this point, only a small number of Walt's key artists remained at the studio or WED, often part-time or as consultants. But the last of the longtime Disney artists admired Ryman's work, both at WED and in his gallery shows. Ollie Johnston, a lead animator, said that Ryman was one of the most talented draftsmen I had ever seen. Animator and director Ward Kimball said that Herbie uh, dazzled us with his brushwork. When asked what made Ryman as a person unique, Kimball added, uh, Herbie was Herbie, and if you weren't there to enjoy it, it was your hard luck. These same employees were also aware that Ryman had had a close relationship with their old boss. Bob Cook, who started with Disney in 1930, said, Herb and Walt seemed to be on the same wavelength. Walt would give him an idea and Herb would put it into visual form. I don't know why they were so intense with each other. Walt would accept Herb's ideas at once the first time he would show them. It was an unusual friendship. Because of this lingering closeness with Walt, Ryman wasn't just a mentor to pass on Walt's ideas to younger artists. He was, in ways an ambassador to pass Walt's ideas on to new fans. At this point, most people understood that Walt had been a real person, unlike Betty Crocker, who had been a marketing department invention. Though many didn't understand, Walt had died, as his image often appeared on the Sunday night Disney TV series. The show at times still included clips of Walt filmed years earlier introducing the show. Uh, there are people in the world, Ryman said, who don't even know that Walt Disney died, believe it or not. They think that Walt Disney is still here, that he's living and he's guiding all of these projects. For them, Ryman wanted to set the record straight, not only about Walt's passing, but also who he had been. After Tokyo Disneyland was fully designed and nearly constructed, Ryman again planned another trip. Among other places, he would travel to Africa, visiting Nairobi and Kenya, before flying to Tokyo to see the new Disney park. He left on January 21, 1983, and flew to Africa, where he spent time with Disney nature cinematographer Jack Kofer, with whom he had worked on designs for the Africa Pavilion. Kofer lived in the southern portion of Kenya, along Lake Navasha. Ryman spent time there studying the landscape and wildlife of Africa. Herb enjoyed the safari-like living in our guest tent on the shores of Lake Navasha, 
Kofer recalled. He completed dozens of sketches each day with the idea that these would become the basis for oil paintings once he returned home. Also among his goals was to develop material for that Africa pavilion that Disney now believed it would add to Epcot Center in the mid or late 1980s. Among Ryman's goals, again, was to understand a new region of the world through art. After weeks of tent living where he spent hours studying hippos, Ryman was ready to move on to a new part of Africa, specifically to a house that Kofer owned in Lamu, near the Indian Ocean. Before departure, Herb asked us if there was something he could take to Lamu for us, Kofer recalled. As Lamu was in a Muslim region where the sale of wine and alcohol was prohibited, Kofer asked Ryman, who was traveling in a private plane, to take a case of wine with him. Kofer believed that the wine would be stored at the house for his arrival, but only months later did he learn what actually happened to the wine. We went to Lamu, Kofer commented. No wine was to be found. Our neighbors commented on the generosity of our guest. He was frequently invited to dinners at neighborhood homes, and he always arrived with a bottle under his arm. When Ryman returned home from his travels, he was again retired, as Wed experienced a slowdown with design work. Wed laid off hundreds of people, but Ryman, who had been listed as a consultant, simply stopped being a consultant. He worked for a time at Landmark Entertainment, a company that designed parks and attractions for, among other clients, Six Flags. In the 1980s, Six Flags believed that they needed to diversify their holdings beyond outdoor thrill parks and include regional parks focused on family attractions, shows, retail experiences, and restaurants. Ryman did design work for a Six Flags indoor park earmarked for the tourist zone in Baltimore called the Power Plant. Its conceit was that the Victorian-themed structure, hidden away for decades, had recently opened to the public. As always, Ryman conceptualized entire lands and ride layouts, including one walkthrough attraction based on the board game Monopoly. Also on the Power Plant project was longtime Disney artist Mark Davis, who worked on character designs for various Six Flags projects. But Ryman's journey away from Disney was short-lived. In the late 1980s, WED, which was then called Walt Disney Imagineering, was developing its second international park, this one to be built just south of Paris. Eddie Sato, an art director who had also worked for Landmark, believed that Ryman might be hired. I was looking for someone to do big things for Main Street, and Herbie was available, so we got him in working on Main Street. He probably did more visiting than he did artwork, but it was interesting just to spend a day with him. With this, Ryman was returned to his old role as artist, raconteur, and Disney mentor. The Paris Park proved to be a more difficult project than Tokyo Disneyland. For the most part, the Japanese adored American culture and largely wanted one of the American parks recreated in Tokyo. The French, however, enjoyed American films but were disdainful of American capitalism and corporatism. This park, in terms of its social tones, needed to be different than the previous three castle parks that Wed had designed. It's very difficult to try to please the French people. Ryman said, and it's very difficult to try to please people there at Walt Disney Imagineering. If we can end up pleasing anybody, it'll be a great surprise. The solution was to embrace elements of American culture, often found in movies, particularly older movies, while moving away from notes of corporatism that defined much of the country. Ryman liked being back at Imagineering, surrounded by young artists. He liked the work he did for Disney. Eddie Sato would have to nudge him at times, away from his socializing and his two martini lunches, back to his easel. But with those nudges, he produced amazing work. As it turned out, it wasn't just the French who found the expanding corporatism of America disdainful. 
Ryman didn't like it either, specifically new Disney managers who held business degrees instead of degrees from art school. Ryman associated these people with Disney's recently hired CEO Michael Eisner. As such, he tried to avoid them. One morning, he told Eddie Sato, I'm not going to any of those meetings. Oh, why is that? Sato asked. If you're going to go to that meeting, you better bring a barf bag. Then Ryman smiled his elfin smile. Ryman, in fact, didn't go to that day's meeting. Later, however, he gave Sato a sketch of a bunch of managers with barf bags up around their faces. But Sato, perhaps a bit annoyed, also understood that Ryman's strong sense of individualism was also one source of his artistic strength. This was how Ryman, in the newly corporate world of Disney, was able to remain his own person with his vision infused into each of his paintings. Ryman's work on Main Street was filled with elegance, taste, and restraint. At times, he described his paintings as being uh, specifically vague, a beautifully detailed image that still had space for the viewer. Main Street in Paris was a slightly different version of those arranged in the stateside parks, a street filled with mid-century optimism, like something plucked out of a film by Frank Capra. This concept of work, a landscape fused to specific emotional tones, was something that Ryman could lower himself down into, adapting Walt's ideas for a new audience. Beyond Main Street, Ryman also proposed a radical design for the castle, as Disney-style castles already existed throughout France. A realistic castle in France would be nothing new. Ryman wanted to create a castle that was magically ensconced in crystal, a structure far more fantasy than medieval or even Victorian in its tone. This proposal was turned down in favor of a castle that appeared copied from a storybook or, more aptly, an animated film. Again, the design impulse was to look to film for inspiration. At times, Ryman worked on projects outside of Euro Disneyland. One of the largest was focused on Walt's original park. Imagineering wanted to incorporate an Indiana Jones ride into Adventureland. The project went through many incarnations. One version presented an indoor coaster moving through a temple. Another paired the Jungle Cruise with the Indiana Jones attraction, in which guests took Jungle Cruise boats to the far side of Adventureland, where they exited the boats and continued on foot toward a proposed Indiana Jones ride area. A much later version included sophisticated ride vehicles arranged like jeeps that carried guests through a show building. Different artists brushed or penciled out their ideas for how this ride area might be integrated into Adventureland. Their work, nearly a dozen images in all, was presented in a conference room for top management to review. CEO Michael Eisner entered the room, walked past a few paintings, then his eyes focused on a canvas at the back. He moved toward it, taking in its colors, its sense of design, the way it invited him to contemplate the experience. Who did that? Eisner said. That's a beautiful painting. Those around him explained it had been done by Herb Ryman. By this point, friends and co-workers noticed that Ryman was slowing down. The rope of old age was closing in around him. His work took more time. Occasionally, he had trouble focusing on projects. Sometimes he used a mall stick to steady his hand while finishing the finer details in a painting. Though Ryman didn't yet know the source of his tiredness and at times pain, he was clearly suffering from something larger than old age. He complained about feeling exhausted and sore. I really could see that he needed some medical attention. His friend, Buzz Price, said, and finally I asked him, no, ordered him, who makes the appointment with your doctor, you or me? The diagnosis was quick and severe, prostate cancer with the tumor already large. He received radiation to shrink the tumor or perhaps to simply slow its growth but the treatments only increased his exhaustion to the point where he retreated to his bed and where he was attended to by Lucille. 
Lucille would also check in on her older sister, Christine, who was also ill. Young artist Atwood continued to admire Ryman. Even though he was bedridden, they visited his house often in small groups. Uh, we saw him when he was ill, Rick Bessel said. Herbie sat up and leaned toward them, his group of young friends, and still tried to impart some of the things he had learned. Now the way to stay at Wed, he told them, is to play dumb. They get rid of anyone who knows anything. Then he smiled so that everyone knew he was joking, or perhaps half-joking. His young mentees asked painter John Horn to make a get-well card, even though Herbie had terminal cancer. It felt funny to do one because we all know he was going to die, Horn said. Alexandra Palasola explained, oh, I remember when we spoke to him when he was sick. He knew he was mortally ill. He didn't seem to appreciate people telling him that he'd be fine. Again, Herbie adjusted himself so that he was sitting up happy to talk with Alexandra. But as they talked, he became tired frustrated that his body was failing. Finally, he confided, I hate my brushes. I can't stand my work. I'm in such pain. In his final days, as he reflected over his career, he became convinced that there was one day that ultimately had changed his life more than any other. That warm September Saturday, back in 1953, when Walt had asked him to create a unified map of his proposed park, Ryman could see, even now, how easily he might have turned Walt down, claiming that he needed to focus on his circus paintings for a gallery show. Even after driving over to the studio, Ryman could have refused the project because he didn't have enough time to do it right. Walt's request for Ryman to work on the Disneyland map could have just as easily had a different ending, with Ryman instead choosing to work on his own paintings. But that day, his reluctant agreement to help Walt had, over time, changed the second half of his life. If I hadn't been at home that Saturday morning, Harper Goff or John Hench or someone else could have done the drawing that started it. Without agreeing to make that original map, the second half of Ryman's life might have turned out differently, his career growing smaller as studios moved some feature film production away from backlots, with Ryman becoming a mostly forgotten studio artist. Ryman could see that on that September day, his life journey had reached a fork in the road, one path taking him back to Disney, the other to regions unknown. Ryman could see now that he had chosen wisely. The path back to Walt was also the path to growth and community. This was what the world had tried to teach him for years, that a person can't hold on to the specifics of their childhood dreams forever. To find success, a person needs to adapt that early dream to fit the changing culture around them. It was a lesson that Ryman mostly embraced during the final decade of his life, a lesson that also held a second meaning. Now, at the end of his life, he could see that his commercial work for the Disney parks held the essence of his art. If I settled down to the effort of portraying something, he said, it must represent me, be a record of my life and my experience. In small but important ways, Cinderella Castle at the Magic Kingdom, New Orleans Square at Disneyland, and the yet-to-be-finished Main Street in Paris all held a small piece of his spirit. As far as he could tell, this was how popular art was created in the second half of the 20th century. It wasn't created by a single person. It was more likely created by a community. Ryman passed away on February 10, 1989, 
two weeks after the passing of his older sister, Christine, leaving only Lucille to carry on the family name and identity. Ryman's final project was Euro Disneyland, a park that would open two months after his passing. The site for this new park, according to designer Tim Delaney, was not far from where Ryman's father had been killed during World War I. In this small way, Ryman's last creative act reframed the central tragedy of his youth into a place that would bring others joy. Decades after his passing, Herb Ryman is best remembered for his work with Disney. For fans of animation, he is often cited as one of the 17 hand-selected studio artists who traveled with Walt in 1941 to South America to develop a series of good neighbor cartoons to better align the political interests of the United States with those of South America against the Nazis. For fans of Disney theme parks, he is often identified as the artist who first laid out elements of Walt's cinematic theme park into a unified illustration. On a single weekend in 1953, with Walt beside him, Ryman used a pencil to place theme lands and attractions into an intricate map, a work originally etched out on vellum, an illustration that Roy Disney took to New York in hopes of finding a TV network who would help underwrite Walt's dream of building a unique park in California. But beyond these two centerpiece stories lies a different side of Herb Ryman, a story in which Ryman's early interests connect up to his final work for the company. In the late 1970s and the early 1980s, Herb Ryman was an artist who developed concept paintings that defined the futurism of Epcot Center and, more importantly, the international flavors of World Showcase. Each of these paintings, a modern masterpiece, transformed the ideas of the Imagineering team into a vista. Images so filled with color and depth that one could mentally move into the landscape as though it were a real place. This was his true gift, to create places on canvas so inviting, people immediately wanted to visit them. His name continues on with Ryman Arts, a nonprofit started by Lucille and others to encourage young artists, much as Herbie had done at the end of his life. His largest contributions to humanity, though, remain the Disney parks, places visited by tens of millions of people each year. Each day, on three continents, people walk past elegant castles or into international villages, many of which were designed by an artist who, as a boy, wanted to know the world. And through art, bring that experience home. Again, now that we're at the end of this series on Herb Ryman, I hope that you are able to take some of this information, some of these stories into your life so that you have richer experiences when you're in the Disney parks and also when you're watching Disney animation from the 1940s. Ryman was an artist who saw the modern world of Hollywood invent itself. He was also an artist who helped create the contemporary world of theme park design. So, the next time you're in one of the parks, by a castle or on Main Street, or perhaps walking through New Orleans Square, I hope that you feel a little deeper connection with those places based on some of the things that together, over many months, we have explored through the life of Herb Ryman. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. As far as I know, we are the only podcast to explore the history of the Disney Company and the Disney parks at this level of length and depth. Together, on these podcast episodes, we have spent 14 hours exploring the life and work of Herb Ryman, also exploring how the Disney company changed and evolved while Ryman was there. 
It's something like a book that, bit by bit, we've moved through together over many months. And hopefully this has all brought you a deeper connection to the Disney films and the parks. We are funded entirely by listener contributions, specifically by listeners who join us on Bandcamp as monthly supporters. On Bandcamp, you'll find over 200 episodes not available on iTunes or anywhere else, including other long series arranged as Bandcamp albums about key figures and key moments in the history of the Disney company. But the best reason to join us over on Bandcamp is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can become a monthly supporter at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. So, I'll be back next week with a new episode... Until then, this is Todd James Pierce.